All right. Uh, welcome back to Extra AI, your podcast series on AI and machine learning applications, where we delve into the intricate world of AI and its profound impact across various industries. And today being the season seven finale, we are honored to have a very special guest with us, Mr. Colin S. Levy, a renowned thought leader in the legal tech space. So in this episode, we are going to dive deep into the fascinating intersection of law and technology, exploring the transformative impact of AI and generative AI on legal practice. Colin, with his extensive experience and insightful perspectives, will shed light on how these emerging technologies are reshaping the legal landscape, basically from automating routine tasks to revolutionizing legal research and also influencing the decision-making process. So we will uncover the different ways in which AI is both challenging and enhancing the traditional practices of law. Uh, Before we get in there, I want to give a brief introduction about uh, Colin. So Colin has levied his name to the prestigious fast case 50 list of legal innovators in 2022. He's a well-known legal tech expert and a corporate lawyer. He is frequently on lists of people to follow for learning about legal tech online, and his blog was named to the 90 most followed legal tech blogs of 2023. Colin is also the editor of the Handbook of Legal Tech, published by Global Law and Business in 2023, and is frequently asked to contribute articles and to participate on podcasts on various law outlets, including Above the Law, Law.com, Bloomberg Law News, Artificial Lawyer, Prism Legal, and others. He's also one of the most widely followed legal tech voices on LinkedIn with about uh, 25,000 followers and on Twitter with more than 14,000 followers. In addition, he contributed to the legal industry's first comprehensive guide to best practices for creating effective legal documents in Microsoft Word. Colin has also served as a judge for the American Legal Technology Awards and for Modern Counsel's 35 Under 35 Lawyers. He currently is Director of Legal for Malbec, a leading contract management company, and has served in numerous prominent legal roles for companies in technology industry for a little over a decade. Colin holds a certificate in legal innovation and technology from Suffolk University Law, Law School, a JD from Boston College Law School and a BA in Public Policy and Law with honors from Trinity College, Hartford City. So as you know, there are a lot of things that Colin is specialized in and he's got a lot of accreditations. So I'm really uh, pleased to welcome Colin on board uh, to have this exciting season seven finale conversation. As always, we will find we will provide you more details about the podcast uh, at the end of our conversation. To all our audience, sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation. Whether you are a legal professional, a tech enthusiast, or just curious about the ever evolving relationship between AI and law. All right, uh, welcome back to our podcast series, Extra AI, on AI and machine learning applications. And today I have an interesting conversation on the impact of AI on law. And I have a guest, Mr. Colin L. Levy. Uh, Colin S. Levy, and today we would like to go into this topic of uh, the impact of AI on law practice. Uh, Welcome on board, um, Colin. Could you say a few words about yourself, your background, and how you are connected with AI uh, in the context of legal tech, maybe? Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, Great to be here. So I am a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for uh, over a decade, and uh, I come to technology from the background of someone who has been uh, working in different technology companies for most of my career and have seen the impact of technology on businesses and have long thought that technology had a role to play in the business practice of law as well. 
Uh, and going back, actually, prior to even becoming a lawyer, I worked for a law firm in New York City where I was doing e-discovery and actually using some technology tools back then. And that piqued my interest in technology and its relationship with the practice of law. And it's something I wanted to pursue following law school. Uh, and I have been pursuing it ever since, really, through conversations with those creating products, those uh, trying to educate others about the relationship. Uh, and then sharing my learnings and lessons and conversations with others. Beautiful. That is uh, great to know about your background, that you're coming from the law practice and then the understanding the impact of AI and impact of technology specifically in guiding the people around. Uh, before getting into the conversation, I try to come up with this. Uh, I know each of us have different experiences of technology or AI. Since we're going to talk about AI and the impact of AI, could you uh, provide an example of AI, whether it is a personal or a professional example, that influenced you or how you have been using in the past and how uh, in the current world you see that the impact of AI is very much prevalent, a professional or a, prof or a personal example that you could quote? Absolutely. So, for example, I, you know, I and so many others use Google to search for things. Uh, what I think a lot of people don't realize is that Google's ability to find information and respond to search inquiries is powered in large part by artificial intelligence. There's a reason why when you're entering in a search query, it's filling, it's completing what you're asking for. And it seems to be fairly accurate most of the time. And that's mm -hmm. in large part due to artificial intelligence. So I think that that is one area in which AI is being used that perhaps a lot of people don't necessarily realize is being used. Uh, for And in addition, it's also being used for, you know, tracking ads, ads that you click on, behaviors that you do online, um, also things you buy in stores, your tra you know, your consumer behavior is tracked and analyzed by artificial intelligence. So I think that artificial intelligence, while seems like it came out of the blue with the rise of generative artificial intelligence has really been around for quite some time. It just wasn't as visible or in your face as it is now. Beautiful. So the, yeah, like you rightfully pointed out about these generative technologies and which uh, maybe in the last one year, if you see November, 2022, and that is when we saw the, rise of uh, generative AI technologies. How do you see the impact of that on your uh, uh, field? And how uh, maybe some thoughts about these kind of new AI innovations that are happening and how that is impacting your field? If uh, And then maybe we can go into our meet of our conversation. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think that generative artificial intelligence uh, for, for me and like the other legal professionals, whether they're lawyers or not, is allowing for the completion of tasks of just summarizing documents, the, the creation of new documents, um, the review of the existing language, those type of sort of repetitive tasks that take time to do and are fairly detour-oriented um, mm -hmm. can now be done by, our, by artificial intelligence fairly well, fairly quickly, and may not necessarily provide you with exactly what you're looking for when you use it, but at least points you in the right direction and gets you there quicker than you otherwise could get there. So it's quite frankly, saving you time, allowing you be, to be more productive and be more efficient as well. And quite frankly, you know, I'm not looking to reinvent the wheel. So it allows me to not have to kind of feel like I'm doing the same thing over and over again and having to think through the same things over and over again. So that I find very helpful and beneficial. And I think we're going to see that continue to be the theme going forward as artificial intelligence continues to play a larger role uh, in the world of work and as well in our personal lives. Great. I think uh, the example that you quoted, I think it greatly amplifies how these uh, new generative AI technologies can realistically help the people in different fields, not only the technology field, and this is where we see the impact of uh, whether it is AI or specifically the generative AI technologies, which are impacting the different fields and the applications 
And I believe uh, we are just scratching the surface and I believe there are a lot more things to come. Uh, maybe let us take a quick break, come back and get into the real meat of today's conversation. All right, so welcome back. I know we are uh, embarking into a new episode or a different kind of an episode today talking about the impact of AI on law practice. And it's I'm very uh, honored to talk with a law professional in this aspect. So I would like to now uh, start with this question, uh, Colin. I know as we have been talking, the applications of AI is changing and creating impact on different fields in different ways. And I believe the practice of law is no new to that. The practice of law is also changing. And now we see that uh, this technology will also be impacting the lawyers and the law practice in a big way. So why are lawyers and technology quickly becoming inseparable with this technology? Any thoughts that you would like to uh, provide? Sure. Well, I think, you know, there are a number of different ways you can kind of approach and answer that question. I think one of the first sort of approaches I would take to answering the question is that as we've seen, technology has continued to play a larger and larger role in how businesses operate and how they create things, how they sell things, uh, and so on. And so because a lot of those businesses tend to be uh, those that rely on and need legal support, I think the legal industry has now recognized the need to be savvy in these technologies and not just savvy in what technologies are being used by their business clients, but also in how these technologies can help them be better lawyers to all of their clients. And so that, I think, has engendered sort of a closer relationship between the two, between legal and technology. I think what also has sort of reinforced that idea uh, is the fact that technology now is playing a bigger and bigger role in the practice of law in terms of how things are done in the legal industry. And that mm -hmm. in turn means that lawyers now have to become more and more familiar with technologies and be aware of which ones may be most helpful to them and their practice, which ones may be most helpful for them to be able to best support their clients and so on. And so really, I think that the, you know, the relationship between lawyers and technology while has one that has largely been tenuous and filled with tension has mm -hmm. now becoming one that is interdependent. And I think that has further been, uh, I think, um, emphasized by the rise of artificial intelligence that now is allowing for things to be done more more and more quickly and more and more efficiently, uh, mm -hmm. which itself, I think, is causing sort of the question to be asked of what it means to be a lawyer, what it means to practice law in an age where technology is so dominant. Uh, and so that really, I think, is a question that remains one that's the top of mind, not just for those who are currently practicing, but as well as those who are learning kind of what it means to be a lawyer uh, and what it means to be involved in the legal industry. Mm -hmm. So from what you are saying, now the new entries or the new set of people getting into the field of law practice, they'll also have this additional AI assistance or additional support from these AI technologies or generative AI technologies, which can help them augment their work a bit more faster and a bit more better. Uh, what kind of, uh, I know, getting into this particular aspect of uh, legal or law practice, what are those particular innovations or particular things that you foresee would be of uh, much helpful or uh, much help for the, uh, for, the for, for your field. I, I know you have briefly highlighted uh, touch base in that, uh, but would you like to, would you care to elaborate a bit more on that? Because I know now the, it doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that uh, the field of law is going to be changed, but the new set of people getting in, uh, I believe there will be a different way of how they will, they can use these technologies. Any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, a number a number of thoughts. I think that you know, as we've seen, artificial intelligence uh, has become more and more accessible to more mm -hmm. and more people. So I think that that uh, is going to be um, of interest to the legal industry, not just in terms of the work that can be done by legal professionals, but also around what their clients are doing with artificial intelligence and how that might impact those that these business clients are seeking to sell to or help or what have you. And really what I'm talking about here is sort of the ethics and the potential regulatory regimes that may surround the use of artificial intelligence. I think we're really at the beginning of thinking about that question uh, and thinking about how to approach it, as we've seen with, you know, the AI Act out of the EU and President Biden's executive order, this is certainly becoming more and more top of mind. Uh, and I think that largely reflects a recognition of AI's increasingly powerful role within society, which certainly I think is going to be of interest to those practicing law now and in the future. Um, in addition, I would add that I think that, uh, you know, the ability to generate content and information using artificial intelligence is going to be of increasing focus because as we've seen artificial intelligence is very good at producing things however it's also very good at producing things that may not necessarily be true or accurate and so mm -hmm. there's a need as well for some quality assurance and quality checking of the content and information that's created by artificial intelligence solutions because there is such a strong tendency for these solutions and an effort to respond to your to your question, if you will, uh, to create something for you, but it may not necessarily understand from a sort of a coding perspective that what it's actually producing is something that is not helpful because it's completely made up and not based in actual real facts or data. Mm. Yeah, I, can, I think I completely agree with what you're saying. I think the different aspects of how this can be used and how it can propel the use of uh, these technologies well when talking about uh, the legal and the law practice field. Uh, I would like to now take one step back uh, and then understand, you know, for the sake of the audience, I know we've been getting into the terminology and talking a bit more about the impact of AI on legal tech and legal uh, and law practice. I would like to take one step back and understand what is legal tech and the integration of AI uh, into the legal sector. What does that mean? Maybe if you can uh, highlight a bit on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that actually, you know, the the what is legal tech is the subject actually of the book that I recently published, The Legal Tech Ecosystem, uh, which intends to introduce the reader to kind of the world of legal tech. And really what, what I would define as legal tech as being um, – Technologies that are aimed at helping lawyers and legal professionals be better at their jobs and better serve their clients, whether they're business clients or individuals or a mix of both. Uh, and so, you know, what's also important, I think, to consider within the context of that is that it's not just about the technology. It's also about mm -hmm. the people, the processes, the businesses. And so it's all about all of them being interdependent and impacting one another and benefiting one another. And that's an evolving ecosystem really and so i think that's really kind of important to understand is that context here matters so putting tech in context of business and context of society is important um and with respect to artificial intelligence artificial intelligence is just yet another really set of tools within legal tech and within technology that are here to help you kind of be more productive be more efficient uh and be more data driven and I also think what is some in particular for the legal sector is it's made the legal sector be more data driven, be more focused on data, on metrics, on analytics. Uh, when for a long time, the legal industry has been largely focused on history, tradition and kind of experience and not so much on sort of tactical data, whereas now technology is shifting the focus on tactical data. And that's been long the focus of business. And also, I think, largely one of the causes for there to be tension between business and, and the laws, business is focused on data and the law is focused more on sort of these theoretical underpinnings of how things can and should be done. And now data is coming into the fold to allow for people to really think about, all right, what is the data telling us about how we approach this issue? 
not just from a legal perspective, but also from a business perspective. And so I, in some ways, I think it's bringing the legal world and the business world closer together. Beautiful. I like the aspect of that you brought up, um, the aspect of people, processes, and businesses, and how historically, where you were focusing mainly on experiences, but now you are also bringing the aspect of uh, data into the whole mix when you're talking about these legal technology and innovations. Uh, can we dive a bit more and understand the key differences between the between legal technology and the innovations, the AI innovations, so that uh, we can fine tune this a bit further. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think I think that sort of you know innovations in AI, um, as I mentioned, kind of at the outset of the of the conversation. You know, Google, for example, has been innovating with AI to improve their search. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we've seen generative AI. Innovations allow for the creation of imagery, the creation of new types of content, the creation of new ways of delivering information um, that really otherwise couldn't be done or, or could be done, but would take a lot of time and effort and, and be time consuming. I also think that we've seen in terms of analyzing data, some innovations on the AI front, for example, using you know algorithms to analyze large amounts of data, for example, on the an litigation analytics side to sort of think about all right, you know, we've got these areas of litigation, you know, we want to pursue perhaps this litigation. Is it actually worthwhile for us to pour resources into this litigation matter? Or is the data telling us that, you know, this might not be all that successful, so perhaps it's better to settle and not pursue it. And so I think that's really increasingly of importance to business clients because they recognize that litigation is expensive and it's slow, at least in the U.S. and it likely is elsewhere as well. And so to avoid that expense, they can see whether the data tells them it's actually worth pursuing or not. Uh, and that is something that AI can really be very good at because AI, above all else, is really good at taking large amounts of data and being able to draw analytics and conclusions from that data. Now, you may not necessarily agree with those conclusions or those conclusions may be right. not necessarily fully complete because of the limitation of the data set that you're using. But that being said, it's really good at being able to analyze large amounts of data that otherwise theoretically be possible by a human, but would take a lot of time and may not necessarily be ultimately successful. Beautiful. I think, uh, yeah, I like the way you have uh, explained this, talking about analyzing this huge amount of data when you are working on some particular uh, litigations or particular legal issues that you are talking about. And now with the help of these AI tools, you can easily understand uh, and analyze these things much faster and much better. Uh, so in that aspect, now if I, uh, I know you have beautifully explained that, but can you provide some examples that you would like to quote when you're talking about I believe the mistakes one can make when evaluating these different legal technology tools. I know you were briefly mentioning that earlier, but I think what can be made, what can what kind of mistakes can be made, and how uh, we can uh, just, uh, sure prevent them. Absolutely. Well, one I can I can provide goes back to um, my personal experience. Um, I was uh, assisting with the creation of a sort of a early stage, uh, fairly simple uh, document slash contract management slash review solution. And the problem that we had when we were evaluating um, potential solutions to assist us with sort of creating the system was that we were, we thought we understood what the goals were and what our internal business clients were seeking. But we didn't actually seek their input or or and bring them in for feedback on what we were trying to evaluate and look at. And that was a problem because we only knew what we knew and we didn't know what we didn't know. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the mistakes you can make is not being collaborative enough and not bringing in key stakeholders and bringing in users early enough when you're evaluating a potential tool. Because ultimately, the power of a tool comes not from the tool itself, but from those who use it. 
And in order to get that value, we have to make sure that the people we want to be using the tool actually will be using that tool. And that means bringing them in early and often for evaluation, for feedback, for getting an idea of not just how they work currently, but how they would look, like to work in the future and seeing if this tool or whatever set of tools you may be looking at could perhaps help get them there. So that's one mistake. I think another is thinking that somehow a piece of technology is going to be the ultimate solution for you, meaning that it's going to be going to solve all of your problems. It's somehow going to magically make all of your issues go away, whether it's a workflow issue, a people issue, a data issue, whatever. Um, technology is not a solution to every problem, it may not frankly even be the solution you need. And the re and you can figure that out by first really doing a deep dive into exactly what problem it is you're having and what an ideal way of what what an ideal world what it looks like it, to not have that problem you know what would be the solution and taking those two bits of information to then evaluate potential technologies can be very helpful because you may realize that I'm not looking at the wrong set of tools perhaps this is in a technology problem this is a culture problem the leadership problem or perhaps it's some combination of both, in which case it's a leadership and a technology problem, what have you. But you can only figure that out by really figuring out first kind of what it is that you're trying to solve for. And that means slowing down before you start looking at tools and understanding kind of what it is you're seeking and why. So that's another mistake. And then the third, I think, is trying to rush into it, meaning not just evaluating a tool, but then rushing into actually using it. And I think the reason why I mention that is it's really important to understand how these tools work. And they're not the type of thing where you just, a lot of these tools, not all, but many of them are not just the type of thing you just suddenly turn on and they magically just work. There are ones right. you have to train. There are ones that you have to get up to speed and provide data for. And so you want to be prepared for that and account for that in your evaluation process and then your implementation process. And so you know, when you're evaluating tools, you want to get a sense of how long does it take for this thing to start kind of actually sh working and using how much is involved, who's going to be need to be involved. Those are things you definitely need to consider when you're evaluating tools, because otherwise you may have made a big investment and then realize, oh, well, that's just start of the investment. Now I have to go get all these people, get them to use it, provide feedback, get them to be provide me with what I need to get this tool working. And people are busy. There's a lot of things that mm -hmm. are happening. Businesses move quickly. So you really need to take that into account when you're evaluating potential tools, because again, these tools are not often ones that you kind of just click on with a switch. Right. So that's a very, very interesting point or a very important point that you have made. Uh, talking about not using the tools for the sake of using the tools, but understanding how these tools can help solve a problem and evaluate these tools before even getting into uh, working on a particular problem or applying in your legal field and how do you uh, get a particular thing solved. Uh, so, which means to say that, yeah, legal technology uh, is not exactly AI, but it is different than AI or it is related to AI. Do you want to uh, fine tune or explain a bit more on that? Because we've been talking about legal technology and AI uh, um, uh, by interlacing uh, a bit uh, so that uh, the audience can kind of get a feel about what you're uh, explaining in the context of, yes, legal technology can be a lot of different tools, but how it can be applied to AI. Yeah, so so artificial intelligence is a type of thing that um, can sometimes exist on its own, as we've seen with like chat, GBT, and other tools. However, mm -hmm. in many cases, it's the type of thing that can be integrated into other tools, whether it be Google, whether it be um, other types of uh, legal tech tools, like contract management tools, for example, they integrate AI to allow you to quickly review contracts or perhaps find missing clauses or perhaps review for particularly risky provisions and things along those lines, or perhaps, you know, suggest a better way of phrasing something or suggest a way to negotiate a particular tricky area that 
often gets negotiated. So I really think that the integration of AI is something that's particularly interesting to consider in the context of legal tech, because that's often how AI shows up. Uh, and not just in terms of contract management, it also can show up in terms of legal research. In other words, you know, you're researching a case and it can suggest other cases that may be useful for you to look at, or may suggest a trend that's evident in case law, or even may suggest a potential effective line of argument you might want to propose and write about in your brief as you're arguing something before a particular judge or court. Um, so those are all different applications of AI within other tools. I think we're going to see more and more of that as well. Uh, and lastly, I would say that AI can really be you know, integrated in other ways in terms of going back to an earlier point I made about it being really good at analyzing large amounts of data. Mm -hmm. With litigation analytics, for example, it's really AI can be integrated into one of those tools to help sort of look at data and show not just trends, but also, you know, hey, this judge has often ruled this way because of these reasons. And therefore, you can draft your brief to more appropriately address the concerns that that particular judge or that particular set of uh, judges tend to go after or tend to push back against. And mm -hmm. that can really be a pretty strong advantage for you when you're arguing a case because you already kind of anticipate potential arguments against your position and then can respond accordingly without having to sort of respond on the fly, which can be sometimes a little bit challenging. So I think that AI really is best understood not just in isolation, but really in the context of the fact that it can be closely integrated and all these different tools. Uh, for example, also your phone, for example. AI mm -hmm. plays a role in, you know, when you're talking to Siri on your Apple phone or when you're conducting a search or we're looking through emails or what have you. It's often playing a role in the background to help get you the information you need faster and quicker by looking at data, looking at your usage and so on. Um, and so that's, you know, I think a really fascinating space. It's also one that uh, likely will be the increased focus of, regulators as they think about use of data and how your data is being used by these AI um, solutions or by these AI-based functionalities within other solutions. Okay, beautiful. So it keeps, it, it keeps me thinking that uh, with all these different kinds of applications of technology and specifically AI in all these other different fields, it's helping the people a lot, but at the same time, I know people like you uh, have been writing books and educating the people and creating awareness so that uh, the people using the technology can benefit a lot and get better things uh, faster and provide better results or better outcomes. But again, um, for people like uh, us coming from the technology field, it is a little different because we kind of get in there and we are uh, working in that field and then we understand the uh, nitty gritty details and then the importance of using the technology. But in the field, in your field, like for example, in the legal field, in the law practice field, you know, there are pioneers like you who are already driving this. But there might be people thinking about how do I overcome the fear of technology? Sometimes it might be even overwhelming. What are your thoughts and what are your suggestions? So, you know, I once, when I was younger, uh, feared technology myself because I saw it as overwhelming and intimidating. So speaking from the perspective of someone who has overcome that fear myself, I think that, it, it, you know, one good way to kind of overcome that fear is instead of thinking about technology in the broadest possible sense. Think about it in the sense of, well, I want to learn more because I want to accomplish this or because I want to do that or because I see it could help me do this. The more specific you can get about thinking about technology, the less intimidating it can be because then you're thinking more in terms of specific tools and less in terms of the overwhelming amount of solutions that exist out there and how they all do different things and how, oh my God, I don't know. I don't know how to evaluate them. I don't know how to look at them. I don't want to have to code and all of that. So I think that's one way of overcoming the fear is kind of being more specific with regards to exactly why you want to learn more about tech um, and what's, you know, your and, and what your motivations are. But I also think another way to overcome it is to just experiment with different tools and just without any particular goal in mind and without kind of needing 
to do it for a specific reason or to meet a deadline or whatever your whatever it is just experiment and just give things a try and see whether you like them or not see what seems to work for you you know the more you experiment the more you learn but also the more you experiment the more you grow comfortable and kind of overcome the preconceived notions you may have about technology so i think that's <laughs> another important part of overcoming a fear whether it be technology or or anything else is to just open yourself up to experimentation and i also will acknowledge you likely you may likely you you may be uncomfortable at times and that's okay it's okay to be uncomfortable that is not sort of you know that may be a scary thought but that just means that you just don't know and that means you should just continue to experiment and learn and go slowly you know you don't need to right. start off by trying to accomplish something huge just for example you know just maybe if you're using generative ai just ask a simple question or if you're using some other tool just try clicking around just seeing what can happen you know you never know and you just really want to just go slowly and learn at a pace that's comfortable to you and then lastly i think is there's a lot of noise out there about technology rather than sort of being overwhelmed by the amount of noise and news that's out there simply focus on you and focus on what you kind of want to learn and what motivates you and use that as sort of your guiding light if you will with the perspective of learning about technology because otherwise it can be indeed overwhelming and fear inducing Right, right. I think you've uh, rightfully explained the different aspects of how to overcome the fear of technology uh, and beautiful examples that you have provided. And so, from what I understand, uh, you 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 perceive this uh, uh, legal technology as an ecosystem. Uh, but why do you call it as an ecosystem? Could you elaborate a bit more on that? Absolutely. You know, it's really an ecosystem because technology by itself is great, but it, it really kind of is most beneficial when it's actually used by people, meaning that technology plus people are rely upon one another and are dependent on one another. Moreover, people are often parts of businesses and trying to do things through a certain workflow or a certain process. And so really these things all feed into one another and rely upon one another more and more. And that's why I call legal tech an ecosystem because it's really composed of more than just tech. It's composed of businesses. It's composed of people, processes, and technology all together really impacting each other and influencing how different technologies get used, evolve, how businesses evolve, how lawyers evolve with meeting the needs of clients and so on. Um, and so really, you know, like any other ecosystem, it needs it needs to be nurtured, it needs to grow, it needs to be given time to develop and learn. And that's really what legal tech is all about, is, is growth, development, learning, and kind of evolving. And that's why I personally have been drawn to legal tech is because it's composed of people who are really eager about building connections with others and learning from them and learning and, and using those lessons to then inform themselves and help broaden their perspectives. And so it's all ever evolving, ever growing, and ever more interdependent. And that's ultimately why I view it as an as an ecosystem, because I think that it's important to see things all as as connected to one another, not see things as sort of isolated from one another or just simply operating in a vacuum. Yeah, I think beautiful. I like uh, the way how you have explained uh, legal tech. Uh, as an ecosystem, when you're talking about people, processes, and technologies, and how they interact with, and how the lawyers there interact, the businesses or with the people, and how all these things are intermingled, and data being the underlying layer, uh, that's a uh, yeah, beautiful way of putting it. I know there will be... <laughs> Uh, I'm, uh, let me ask this interesting question. Like I, I term this as a million dollar question or the billion dollar question uh, when I do the podcasting. Uh, and I ask my guests, uh, I know there is this uh, huge competition out there. Uh, typically, I think uh, the question is that how do I differentiate from my competition? But let me put it in a little different way, right? Like there is a lot going on here about 
how do you use technology? And you know that sometimes you use technology that might become obsolete. Uh, and maybe there might be questions that uh, uh, I learned something, it might become uh, obsolete. And this is not my main uh, area of expertise because for people like uh, outside of technology, it is that you have your own uh, field of expertise and that you have to focus on. So how do I keep myself relevant? Uh, could you explain to the audience, maybe taking your example or maybe taking a different example, uh, how do you can how you can keep yourself relevant and how you make sure that the technology that you're learning sometimes might change or might even become obsolete, but how do you keep progressing further? So I think that's an excellent question. And I think there's a couple of ways to, uh, to answer that question. First, I think that rather than, well, it's important to learn, I think, you know, the types of tools that exist out there. You know, I think that the specific types of tools will change a little bit, but not a ton. I think that in addition, the concepts underlying technology don't really change. They're fairly standard. So I think understanding kind of the types of tools and the concepts that underline those tools are important. Those things tend to be more static and don't change as often as otherwise. So I think that's that's sort of one way to answer that question. I think another way is to understand the fact that adaptation is just the way forward. So you have to always be learning and always be open to new ideas and new ways of looking at things. And that's why earlier I was talking about experimentation and because the more you experiment, the more you learn, the more you grow comfortable kind of just exploring the unknown. And that's another way I think to stay relevant. Um, and then lastly, I think it's to continue to kind of see things in a broader context. In other words, look at technology as a way in which society operates and which businesses operate and see how its impacts continue to in some ways be the same and in some ways change. And I think that is another good way to kind of stay on top of things and stay relevant. Um, and yes, you know, is there a possibility of you learning a potential tool and it becoming obsolete? Of course, but that's been true for a very long time. I mean, there are tools I learned about back in high school that are now irrelevant. And I think that's just kind of part of part and parcel of just technology itself as it's ever evolving. So I don't think you need to, you should fear or necessarily, you know, run away from learning specific tools because you fear they're going to become obsolete. It's more a matter of learning these tools and then seeing how they evolve over time. You know, as we've seen with generative AI, it evolves over time. It's not necessarily replacing itself, but it's definitely evolving. And that is the case with other technologies as well. So I think that really it's just a key of just being open to adaptation, being open to change, and in some ways being comfortable, being uncomfortable at times. Beautiful. Some great uh, piece of advice that you have provided here. I think uh, it's amazing. Uh, so thank you for joining our podcast, uh, uh, Colin, and for sharing your wisdom. Uh, any key takeaways or closing remarks that you would like to provide? And maybe additionally, uh, in your field of work, uh, what kind of AI innovations are you looking forward to and how uh, you prepare yourself or what are your thoughts or any uh, closing remarks that you would like to provide to the audience? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, we'll answer the second question first. I think that um, artificial intelligence will continue to grow uh, more powerful and be able to do more and more things for us as we've seen with uh, generative AI and, and uh, open AI's recent GPT Creation, we now have the ability to create little tools that can help us do things quicker or faster. I think we're going to see more and more of that going forward. Um, eventually, I don't know when this will happen, but eventually we'll see uh, likely some early stage computers or devices where um, we'll simply talk to them and they will continue and they will respond to things we request. Kind of the way Siri operates now or like Amazon Alexa, but even more so, even more powerful and capable. Uh, so that's really where I think I see things going with artificial intelligence. Um, in terms of additional resources uh, or references or ways to find me, uh, I'm on LinkedIn Colin, uh, under Colin Levy. You can visit my website, colinslevy.com. That's C-O-L-I-N-S-L-E-V-Y.com. 
Uh, I'm also on Twitter slash X at C Levy underscore law. That's C L E V Y underscore law L A W. And then you can also find my book, the legal tech legal tech ecosystem on Amazon. Uh, please check it out. And again, pleasure being with you. Great conversation. Beautiful. Uh, I think one last question I forgot to ask you. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask you about uh, the book. Do you want to uh, talk very briefly about your book? I know. Oh, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> of course. So, you know, the book uh, was a three year uh, project uh, started in 2020, um, right when kind of COVID started taking over the world. Um, and, uh, really it was a labor of love for me to try to do what I can to introduce the legal professional to the world of legal tech as told by not just myself, but stories from those that I have either worked with or talked with or interviewed. So it's really a thematic kind of anecdotal interview, uh, interview style way of introducing the word, uh, the reader to the world of legal tech. I encourage you to check you out, uh, check it out. It's really, um, I think, a very accessible introduction um, and intended to be a non-technical, very accessible, non-intimidating way to learn more about this space that I think will become increasingly important to uh, lawyers and other legal professionals. Beautiful. I think I'll uh, tag your book along uh, when we release this episode and we send the message out there on LinkedIn. Well, uh, it's a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Really enjoyed the conversation. All right. So as we conclude, not just this episode, but also an incredible season seven of Extra AI podcast series, I, I would first want to extend my deepest gratitude to Colin S. Levy for joining us today. Colin, your expertise and insights into the evolving realm of legal tech and the impact of AI and Gen AI on law practice have been both enlightening as well as inspiring. Your contribution has truly made the season finale a memorable one. So I will be tagging Colin on the LinkedIn post. So if you have any questions, you can directly reach out to Mr. Colin S. Levy. Alternatively, you can reach out to me, Raghu Banda, on my LinkedIn profile and I can uh, put you in touch with uh, Mr. Colin. As always, you can reach out to me on my other social media channels like on my Twitter handle or X handle RK Banda, or you can directly go to my website extraai.com, xtrawai.com, and there you will find humongous amount of a lot of other episodes in the realm of AI. And as always, to our amazing audience, keep sending those interesting feedback and interesting questions and requests about new sessions, and we will try to bring them in. Thank you all for being with us throughout the season. Your enthusiasm, engagement, and curiosity are what makes this podcast a thriving hub of knowledge and discussion. Your support is invaluable, and it's been an absolute pleasure to share this journey of exploration and discovery with all of you. And finally, as we draw the curtain on season seven, remember that this is not a goodbye, but a brief pause before we return with much more engaging and thought-provoking content. And season eight is just around the corner, starting in the new year 2024. And we promise it will be packed with even more fascinating conversations, expert insights, and deep dives into the world of AI and technology. So stay, cu stay tuned. Keep those curious minds active and be ready to join us again in 2024 for season eight of Extra AI. We are always excited to bring you fresh perspectives, new ideas, and interviewing discussions that will continue to challenge and expand our vast understanding of AI and its impact on our world. Thank you all and enjoy the upcoming holiday season and we can't wait to reconnect in the new year for another season of Extra AI. Until then, keep innovating, keep learning and stay ahead of the curve. Happy predicting the future with AI technologies. Thank you and this is Raghu Banda, your host, signing off. Bye-bye now.